This is quite an old story. Uh, it's called Nine Lives. The woman slid open the glass patio doors and carried an empty wicker basket to where the clothes hung drying on the washing line. Her face was hard, set, the mouth slightly twisted from a bicycle accident in her youth. She took the clothes from the line one by one, garment by garment, folded them and placed them neatly in the basket. Warm light spilled out onto the paved patio area and the easy sound of a television laugh track could be heard above all the other random sounds of early evening. Two cats slunk out behind the woman and curled between her legs, almost tripping her up in the dimming light. After she'd gathered in all of the washing, the woman went back inside, closing the doors behind her with an unnecessarily violent shove. The cats remained outside, watching the falling darkness. Michael stepped out from behind the tree and paused as she drew shut the curtains. The light from the room withdrew, becoming nothing more than a thin pale line showing through the gap between the heavy drapes. He walked towards the house, stepping carefully over the overgrown planting beds and onto the long, narrow lawn. He used the side access to go around to the front of the building and then fished out his key to unlock the door and gain access to the two-storey semi-detached house. He took off his work coat and hung it on the banister in the hall and then walked through into the kitchen. The woman, his wife Valerie, was bent down, unloading pots and plates and cheap cutlery into the dishwasher. She had her back to him and when she heard him enter she did not turn to greet him. He waited for her to face him, to speak, to do anything at all. Hi, she said, the words falling uselessly into the open kitchen appliance. How was your shift? Tiring, he said, closing his eyes for a moment, seeing a strange light flare behind the lids. When he opened them again, nothing had changed. Problems with the machines. A couple of the operators were playing up too because they were, they were losing bonuses. Oh, said Valerie. She placed the last few items into the dishwasher and firmly closed the door. She wasn't quick enough for Michael to notice that there were two dirty wine glasses, the good ones with the long stems, and he could smell the ghost of cigar smoke in the air. Michael did not smoke cigars. How was your day? I asked rooted to the spot. The clock on the wall seemed to tick too loudly. The pipes behind the wooden panelling gurgled madly as they carried hot water to the dishwasher. OK, the usual. I spoke to Katie this morning and she's still going through with the divorce. The milkman came for his money and the window cleaner popped in to say that he's off on holiday for two weeks and would be round to clean the windows on the 17th. Ah, did Ben come round? Did she stiffen? Did her shoulders tense? Her back strain ever so slightly? He wasn't sure. Any movement she might have made was fractional. Yes, he stopped by to drop off your drill. Said to thank you. She turned then, at last, and the smile on her face was as plastic and lifeless as everything else in the house. The fake flowers in the vase on the dining table, the department, the department store rubber plant that stood in the pot by the little window in the hall. All of it false, an illusion of domesticity. When she approached him, he clumsily raised his hands. The confused expression that flashed across her pale features told him that she was unsure whether to fend off an attack or fall into an embrace. He told him almost everything he needed to know, confirming what he had known without admitting to himself for weeks. She closed her eyes when he leaned in to kiss her, turning her head off her cheek at the last minute. When Michael planted his lips at the side of her mouth, she grimaced. You smell of beer, she said, pulling away and running her hands across the front of her skirt, smoothing the material across a tiny pot of belly. Yeah, Bob and I stopped in at, the, at, the, at his club for a drink after work. We had shift rotors to discuss. Her tone was bitter, almost caustic, when she replied, You and your damn rotors. How's the baby? The question seemed to take her by surprise and her face softened, looking more human and compassionate, more real. She's asleep, went off like a charm. We're lucky, he said, meaning so much more than the child sleeping peacefully in the room upstairs. Valerie said nothing in return. He followed her through into the living room, wishing that he could reach out and hold her, tell her that everything was going to be fine, that they'd get through it, whatever it was, but that moment had long passed. This was the aftermath. Another of the cats padded past him as he sat down, its soft warm body brushing against his leg. He suppressed a shudder. He'd never liked cats. He was more of a dog man. Cats were cold, calculating. Dogs were your friends. More than anything right now, he needed a friend. In the silence that followed, Michael heard the rest of the cats running across the floor in a room somewhere above him. The baby's door was close tight to the frame, but still he feared that the rampant felines would encroach to cause harm. He was all too aware of the old wives' tale regarding cats sitting on the chests of newborns and stealing the breath from their lips. You want the telly on? What? Sorry? The telly, she repeated, lowering herself into the chair by the window. Anything on you want to watch? No, he said, unable to meet her gaze. That's OK. Whatever you want is fine. She crossed her long legs as she perused the television guide and her stray hair fell loose from the Alice band on her head to trail across her brow. She did not flick the hair back into place and his heart grew heavy and cumbersome at the sight. He was reminded of the girl she'd once been, the lively, headstrong young beauty who had conceived his child and promised to take on the world at his side. Then he thought of machine feelers and shift rotors. Somehow these things seemed in interconnected like the cogs of some huge industrial machine. A cat scratched its claws against the door, which was ajar, so they could hear if the baby cried, and forced it fully open. When it slithered inside, the cat watched him through cruel green eyes. It sat on the floor and stared at him, and slowly began to lick clean its paws. Michael didn't know which one of the eight this was. 
He wasn't able to remember their names, and all cats looked the same to him anyway. Valerie took in stray cats like other people collected old beer bottles or pieces of antique furniture. It was her thing. She'd always done it. Michael wondered how far her capacity for charity stretched. Ben, her friend from the twice-weekly evening classes she attended to learn about the history of art, had left the army on a medical discharge. He'd returned home from Iraq, suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, and now lived off state benefits combined with a healthy army pension. He even received a mobility allowance to pay for a new car every three years. Michael drove a ten-year-old Volvo with a rotten exhaust pipe and a leaky fuel pump. Somehow it didn't seem fair. Not any of it. Just then the telephone rang, a sudden shrill scream and all that tense silence. Valerie glanced at him over the magazine she was reading, and he shrugged his shoulders. They both knew it would be for her. Nobody ever rang Michael anymore, except to try and sell him insurance he didn't really need. Valerie sighed, got up from the chair on the other side of the room and went out into the hall. When she picked up the phone, her voice changed, becoming light and cheery. He knew it was Ben on the other end of the line before she even said the name. Michael inched forward in the armchair, put his head in his hands. Cats ran in and out of rooms, up and down stairs. Valerie giggled and then dropped her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Michael was reminded of the time a few weeks ago when he'd come home early from a day shift to find Ben's car parked on the drive. The man lived only two or three streets away but still felt the need to be behind the wheel, as if his car represented safety from the outside world. Too afraid to enter the house and discover the thing he feared most, Michael had turned around and headed back to the factory. There he'd locked himself in his office until well after quitting time, waiting for the world to fix itself and wondering what exactly it was that had been broken. A single painful image of that day remained carved into his mind like a scar, the sight of the bedroom curtains closed in the middle of the day. He left the room feeling like an intruder in his own life. When he passed Valerie in the hall, she lowered her eyes to the floor. The smile on her lips was directed into the telephone receiver. It was a smile he had not seen across her face since before they were married. That smile told him the rest, filled in the few knowledge gaps that remained. Outside, sitting in a fold-up chair in the garage and drinking a cold beer straight from the bottle, Michael watched the sky unfurl like a pair of giant black wings. He thought of his daughter being raised by another man and felt like howling. He considered the logistics of being a weekend father, taking his increasingly distant child to a local park or a matinee show at an out-of-town cinema, followed by a trip to a busy McDonald's restaurant and shivered despite the warmth of the evening. The cold eye of the moon glared down at him, judging and finding him, in, and finding him wanting. The cats showed up one by one, appearing like tiny wraiths in the doorway, settling themselves down on the cold floor beneath the raised aluminium door. Once all eight were present, they began to purr in tandem, a strange toneless chorus meant only for him. Michael's toolbox was open on the shelf, left there when he'd broken off from trying to fix up the Volvo's exhaust last weekend. He finished his beer in two gulps, then stood and approached the front of the garage. If the cats move, he thought, it's over. If they run from me, I'll stop this before it even begins. But the cats stayed where they were, sitting on the concrete threshold just inside the doorway. Michael reached up above his head and grabbed the sharp edge of the ribbed garage door, pulling it out and down in a single smooth mo motion. He always kept the mechanism well oiled, so the manoeuvre was almost soundless as the exit was sealed. He bent down and picked up the first of the cats, the one that had watched him silently from the living room carpet. It did not struggle. None of them did. Not even when he carried them over to the workbench and took up the hammer, hefting it high above his surprisingly clear head, with an arm that felt strong as wrought iron. The weight of the tool felt good in his fist and he never wanted to put it down again. By the time he'd finished, sweat covered his face and shoulders and ran freely down the back of his legs. He was breathless. The anim animals lay stacked in a neat pile at his feet, bloodied and twisted, the force of a single blow to which thin skull had flattened their delicate little heads like squashed fruit. He opened the garage door and then returned inside to collect the cats. He lined them up in the driveway, tails pointed out into the street. They formed a small procession of exclamation marks, a correctly punctuated queue of unfulfilled promises and lost moments of mutual misunderstanding. The shattered bodies represented the sorry debtors of a marriage, a sacrifice as well as graphic symbol of what was lost and could never be regained. Eight dead cats, eyes glassy and bulging, fur matted with red. Using his free hand, Michael awkwardly lit up a cigarette and smoked it down to the filter. He glanced upwards and found that he could now look the man in the moon directly in the eye. He ground out the butt under the square heel of his work boot and took one final breath of pungent night air. It tasted good, like freedom, and smelled of something far more difficult to pin down and shape into words. Michael craned his neck to peer bleakly up the street in the direction of Ben's house and then returned his gaze towards what was meant to be the hope of his own comfortable existence. It took a few minutes to make his decision, but now had all the time in the world. Turning his back on the quiet street, Michael went back inside to see his wife.